Welcome to this week's Baker Orange Roundtable. I'm Jim Joyner. We're here with head football coach Mike Grosther, and we're talking about concussions. And you've been around the game long enough that you've seen a lot of different sides of injuries and concussions for sure. Yeah. Yeah, going back, you know, even I'm going to date myself, but I played in the 80s in concussions, even, you know, coming up through Pop Warner and high school football I and mean, in college football. Concussions were treated a lot different back in the day. I mean, it was more, are you all right? Answer a few questions. How many numbers am I holding up? Uh, okay, maybe sit a series or two till your cobwebs are gone. And then you got back in there and played unless you were just absolutely knocked out and out of it. Uh, we really didn't have doctors on the sideline, you know, giving you the battery of tests that they do. We didn't have a baseline. You know, the, now we have a baseline be, before the season. We, we test them. And then once we think they might have had a concussion, you go back and retest that same test. And if you're off, you're not playing. The biggest thing I see nowadays is if you say you have a headache or there was something in a play that showed you might have hit your head and you're showing a little dizziness or walking a little awkward, and that, those are symptoms of concussions. And once you show that, you've got to have seven days of symptom free before you can go back and practice or play. So say it happens on a Saturday and you still got a little headache on Tuesday and then Wednesday it goes away and back in the day you playing Saturday. Now you go from that Wednesday, you cannot participate to the following Wednesday, seven days of symptom free. And so to me, at times you look at it and you say, oh gosh, you know, as soon as a kid gets hit, you know you're gonna lose him for a week or two. But then you also look at, okay, we're doing the right thing. You know, it's a head injury, it's like a back injury, you really don't know. You don't know what's going on until you really look at it and, and really study the symptoms. So to me, it's one of those things you gotta be careful because there's, there could be really bad side effects. When I say side effects, death if you get number two. So I think we're going in the right direction. Now one position on the field that surely needs a lot of help is the quarterback position. Do you think that sometimes the quarterbacks are favored a little too much and they get a little bit too much protection from the referees? Uh, I played that position and, and, and I enjoy the hitting aspect of it and, and that type of uh, atmosphere the game of football presents. But, you know, now I look at this day and age, everybody's bigger, faster, and stronger. So those collisions are even more impactful. And yet, nobody really understands the quarterback position unless you played it. But you're standing there still not knowing the hits coming from what direction because your focus is down the field when you're throwing the football. And you are standing still, and if they catch you from behind, that's like a car wreck. That is a sitting whiplash effect because you're standing still, and they're coming full blast. So at with about 270 pounds behind it, you know, usually. So nobody would ever understand unless they experience that, the pain the shock and uh, the possible whiplash head injury that you get just from either the hit or you hit the ground impactful. So no, I, I think, you know, with how big and strong this day and age the players are, I think you need to protect the defenseless player. So a quarterback standing there is defenseless. A punter standing there is defenseless, a kicker that's really not involved in the play and is kind of undersized usually, but we got some big kickers. Ours is pretty athletic, so he'll go down and make a play. But those type of things, I think that's where the game is. They're trying to protect those type of players. Now talking about the defenseless player, that goes into the new targeting rule that's been in college yeah. football this year now. Talk about what sort of impact that's made and Baker's experienced that firsthand this yeah, season. Yeah, we did. We, we probably lost one of the first kids, possibly, and when Preston Randolph laid a beautiful football hit uh, below the shoulders on a young man, but it was not perceived as that, and we had to appeal it. I think with the camera angles that we have on TV and at every big college and NFL game, the rule's pretty good. At our level, it isn't, because we don't have that instant 
decision maker and the camera angle. We have to wait a week, go through appeals. I don't like the rule because I think it takes away from football. Football a, a, is a uh, violent sport and defenses are taught to hit. And it's hard to tell a kid that's coming full speed where to hit a guy, you know? And then the offensive player could be ducking and now his angle of hit changes midstream. You can't change as a defensive player. So then it's the judgment of the referee. Did the offensive player's head drop to make it a helmet to helmet contact? Now I do believe in the rule and it's always been a rule. They're just enforcing it different. They're throwing a guy out of the game now. They've always thrown the flag for spearing. That was back in our day. I'm not putting you that old, but I'm just saying in high school football um, or Little League. But they're just enforcing the ejection, which I don't like. I think that's the poor part of this new rule. Go ahead and call the spearing. Go ahead and call the hit above the neck. I love it. But but don't throw a guy out of the game. And And – it seems to me like every time there's a big hit in a game now, a yellow flag's coming out. I don't like that aspect. I think the game was made around big hits. You know, football is a collision sport, and the game is, is played that way. So I, I'm, I'm a little leery of this new rule from an ejection standpoint. But if, if hits above the head are going to be called, or if you strike with the crown of your helmet, that's fine with me. Yeah, I'm a little bit with you right there in regards of sometimes this affects the defensive player more than it does the offense player because they have to slow down yeah. and they have to think about what they're doing. Yeah. And on Randolph's hit, it was a clean shoulder to the yeah. chest, and that's exactly what you want on the football field. And so I think that they should back down a little bit on some of the rules, especially the ejections. And yeah. like in that game, it was just such a quick instinct. Yeah. Instead of thinking about it, they just said, you're gone. Yeah, it was in our 10 years here is, is the best hit in, or one of the best in Liston Stadium. And, and we kind of talked about that as, on our football team. And Preston never went down to the ground. He, he stood, bang, did the hit, you know, gave the hit and stood there. Not like he was trying to launch himself at the, at the offensive player. The thing that, Jim, that, that bothers me about this rule, and I think the NFL is, is starting to bring this up, is it's causing defensive players now to go towards the knees and lower. And, and when you start doing that, you're going to begin to have broken legs, a lot of ACL, MCL, whatever injuries, and the game of football does not want to be played like that. We, we do not want that because – when you're not ready and you don't see a hit coming at your legs, there's nothing you can do. Your feet are planted in the ground, and you're, something's got to give, and it's going to be a knee or a leg. And that's nearly the same thing with the Andre Jolly, except that was a horse yeah, collar. A little different play, but still very I, detrimental. I like horse collar rule. I mean, we put that into effect probably two to three years ago. Uh, fantastic rule, because when you do grip, inside the shoulder pad to pull them down. It's just like a face mask. When you grip, your head's going to turn. When you pull on a shoulder pad, your body's going to react different and be pulled down at an awkward angle, which unfortunately Andre went through that. But that's a great rule. Tackling should not be horse. You know, if you horse collar somebody, it should be called 15 yards. Exactly. And now talk about what would happen. I don't think I've ever seen this happen, but what would happen if as a head coach, you didn't follow through with the concussion policies and put someone back out on the field that was not ready. Well, I think you're liable. I mean, I hate to say that. We're liable in a lot of ways. Uh, the doctors are, are being real careful about liability, and I think our trainers are, are liable as well. You know, we've got to all mind our P's and Q's. I'm not a doctor. I'm not trained to, to, to diagnose that type of injury. I've seen it, I've, I've experienced it myself, but you can't, you can't predict what's going on in a young man's brain at that time and how big the impact. Now, things they are doing, uh, they're, Riddell's doing a study and they're putting uh, sensors in helmets and it's an immediate feedback to the trainer on the sideline that so-and-so jersey number 18 took an impactful hit in his, on his head and it, and it shows how hard the hit was. So now that trainer is aware that number 18 just got a shot to the head, I need to look at him or I need to see how he's reacting. 
And if there's a succession of big hits during the game, uh, that trainer is going to be aware of who's getting the big head knocks. So do I like the direction that's going? Uh, maybe. Now, are the sensors correct? You know, and then you got you to gotta say, well, does number 25 head able to hit harder than number 18s? You know, because you know, bodies are different. And, and brains are going to react differently. So uh, it's a whole new dynamic. I think we're at the infant stages of this cause and effect and how will it affect the game of football. You know, people are going to get bigger and stronger. That's the nature of, of the way we're going here. Um, so I, I like the idea that we're trying to protect our sport, but I'm worried about where we're headed. You know, is this going to cause our sport to eventually not exist? And the the main question that we're going for here with this segment is, would, would you let your son play football? I know he's grown up in it. Hey, uh, it's a great question. Uh, I've got two kid, two sons and an older daughter. And my middle son has shown an interest, but not big enough for me to push him. And I'm a big believer that football has been great to me. And I started at age seven and my dad was a football coach. So it was a natural thing to do. And I suffered some early concussions. Um, I'm not pushing it until he comes to me and absolutely says, dad, I want to play. And then I'm all for it because football is a game that you got to be all in. You got to love it and want to do it or it's not going to be a good experience. And I'm also, I want at, at a young age, any kid out there to have a great experience early, to have fun. That, that's what makes a career out of football. Sometimes kids start too early, they get hit, they're not used to taking a hit and they absolutely don't want to experience it anymore. And, and maybe they grow up to be a big, strong kid and would have been a good athlete and a pretty good football player, but they didn't want to play anymore. So there's a fine line when you start them. Uh, hopefully the youth football coach is great. That's a big key factor when I say great, that they promote fun and, and the, you know, the experience of the game of football and teach the proper techniques. Uh, my youngest son, who's eight, is dying to play. I mean, ask me every day, it plays, he doesn't even watch our games. I mean, he does, but he plays football during our games. And uh, so I'm having to, make that decision probably next year early. I think I'll opt for flag football, let him get that experience and enjoy the, the aspects of football without all the contact. And then when he's big and strong enough to, to, to be able to play tackle football, I'll let him go. Um, it's a hard, hard decision for parents. I, 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 am, I understand both sides of the fence. And uh, once you turn them loose to the game, let them go have fun. And, you know, injuries are going to happen. But uh, hopefully uh, we protect our youth uh, well enough that it's nothing serious. Well, thank you, Coach Grossner. Always, always with your great aspects of things. And, hey, good luck this weekend thank as you. taking on the uh, Evangel, correct? Yeah, Evangel Crusaders coming in here. Very good football team. Very athletic. Uh, you know, we got quite a challenge. They've got skill kids all over, and uh, their quarterback plays at a very high level and defensively they're aggressive and come after you. So challenges everywhere, but uh, I like the way we're playing right now and, and our, kids will, our, our kids will take care of business. Well, thank you, Coach Grossner. This is Jim Joyner with the Baker Orange Roundtable.